All right, welcome Storyline. We're good. It's good to see you this morning. I want to add my welcome and congratulations for you being here on time, on Time Change Sunday. We're thankful. Those in the first hour, it, it was possible that they were there by accident, that they forgot completely, and they just showed up thinking it was the 1030 and it was actually the 9 o'clock service, but you had to be here on purpose. So welcome, and it, uh, it's amazing. We're going to refer to our smartphones a couple of times today. So these, these things are amazing. It does it for you now. You don't even have to manually set the clocks back anymore. But I don't trust it. I don't know if there's somebody else in the room like that. I still put my uh, old watch beside my smartphone. And when I woke up this morning, I glanced at it first to make sure that it had actually done what it was supposed to do. And it did. So here we are on time. Welcome. I'll add my greetings to any of you that are visiting for the first time. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Storyline and also have the uh, opportunity to serve as the church planting resident, which means, uh, for those of you that may be new, my wife Sarah and I and our five kids moved to Colorado last year to partner with Storyline for the whole purpose of planting a new church. And we are still on that journey. And by God's grace and according to His, His will, uh, that will launch next year. And so just a few weeks ago, we announced the name of our church. I want to show you again, our name, the name of our church will be Elevate Church in Westminster. And the two arrows that make up the letter A point to our two-point mission of lifting up Jesus and building up people. Uh, that's what we're going to be all about. And we're excited about that journey. And I wanted to thank you for your prayers already. Uh, by God's grace, we were able to move into a home that God provided for us in Westminster a few weeks ago. That was a big step for us to move there and actually began meeting our people in the city of Westminster. And we also had the privilege to serve a meal at Moore Middle School. I just want to show you a couple pictures of this. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we got to serve at a parent-teacher uh, conference day. Teachers have 12-hour days on those days, and so we got to go in and serve that meal and I wanted to give a quick uh, shout out to a guy in our church. His name is Ted Strauch. Uh, Ted was uh, instrumental in planning and preparing and helping serve that meal. Uh, it was just fun to work with one of our guys in that effort. And I have an ask of you this morning. You can take that smartphone back out if, if you want. You don't have to do it this way. Uh, but we, we are really praying for God to give us at least 100 new subscribers to our newsletter. And the reason that is important is that we send out a regular newsletter to those who are following our journey, and uh, there's prayer requests, there are opportunities to serve, there's updates, and uh, it's just for you to be informed as our partner in sending church as what God is doing with us. So you can actually go to elevatetogether.org uh, right on your phone and scroll down to the very bottom, and it'll take three seconds to put your name and your email address in if you would like to receive that newsletter, um, or you can sign up um, on paper at the info desk afterwards. Just make sure you write neatly so I can put your email address in correctly. Uh, let me give you one quick highlight. We're going to send this out in the newsletter, but I wanted you especially to know about this. On December the 7th at 6.30 p.m., we're going to host an interest meeting, and um, all this is exactly what it is, is if you have any interest on any level in um, connecting with us and maybe even possibly serving with us one day, in Westminster. We would love to invite you to be a part of this meeting. Just information only. Um, obviously, no commitment, no pressure. I'm not good at any of that anyway. We're just going to share our mission, our vision, our values, our strategy, our timeline, all of those things. Allow for question and answer and just some, some interaction, maybe for you to just get to meet our family for the first time. I don't know. But if you have any interest on that, um, you, you can either email me from that same website or see me at the fireplace afterwards. Or if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get a reminder in that to sign up for that interest meeting. So I would love for you to be aware of those things. And really thanks for uh, following our journey. Okay, last Sunday, Adam, our group's pastor, introduced our encounter series in the Gospel of John. And he talked about Jesus meeting the woman at the well in John chapter 4, an awesome story. And through that, Adam emphasized how Jesus, only Jesus, or an encounter with Jesus, brings real hope and lasting satisfaction. Um, today, we're going to look at another chapter in John, and that's chapter 9. So grab a Bible, find your place in John chapter 9, or your app, find your place in John chapter 9. If you're using one of the Bibles that's provided in the seats in front of you, it is page 869. Now, again, for context, for those of you who may be new to the Bible, new to church, John is the fourth gospel or the fourth uh, record or angle perspective on the life and the ministry of Jesus, and we find that in the New Testament of the Scriptures. 
And so John writes his gospel, his letter, mainly uh, to declare that Jesus is the Son of God. He emphasizes over and over again through Jesus' statements and through his miracles that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Now, this is, John chapter 9 is all one story. Not all the stories are this long. This is 41 verses long, and I want you to hang with me because we're going to go through this entire chapter. Um, If you walk out in disbelief, I don't blame you, but I promise you we're going to do it. We're going to keep it moving, and I I felt like we really just needed to look at the whole story in its entirety to to see what Jesus is teaching. So here's here's what Jesus wants us to see as a main point from John chapter 9, that an encounter with Jesus is an encounter with truth. In this passage, for the second time in John, Jesus proclaims, I am the light of the world. Light represents truth all throughout Scripture. Light gives clarity. Light gives direction. Light shows us where to go. And Jesus says, I am the light, the the truth giver, the clarity provider for the entire world. Now, okay, I want you to take your smartphone back out. For those of you who have one of these, go ahead. Don't, don't worry. It's all right. And I want you to turn your flashlight on. Okay, do that. If it takes you more than five seconds, this is about to be a revelation to you, that you have a flashlight on your phone. It's amazing. It's actually better than many that you can buy. All right, turn your, turn your lights on and hold them up for me. I want to see how many lights we have in the room. Okay, good. And this, we're going to make an application. We're going to come back to this at the very end of the sermon. This is one of my favorite features on the phone. I think I could justify the monthly cost just for the flashlight. I use it all the time. We're just moving into our new house. So I'm using this regularly to to peek under stuff and, you know, uh, look behind the TV. Uh, Even yesterday, uh, I was looking under one of my vehicles and laid it on the ground so it would shine up. It's fantastic. All right, so here's my point. These are useful, uh, good instruments to have and, and utilize. But what we need more than a physical light to help us at times, and we can probably do without those, we can't do without, on a spiritual level, the light and the truth that we receive from Jesus Christ. There's just no way. The Bible says that we are born in darkness, we're blind, we're dark, we're lost, and and on top of all of that, the darkness of this world pushes in on an everyday basis. And so we need not just an encounter with Jesus, the light of the world, we need an ongoing encounter with with Jesus. And so in this story, Jesus addresses two groups that respond differently to his light. We see this blind man and we see the religious leaders. And we also see how Jesus weaves together a physical healing with the spiritual healing of this man who was born blind. All right, so let's read together starting in verse 1. The Bible says that as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. At first reading, that doesn't seem to be too amazing. But at the end of chapter 8, look back sometime, Jesus is actually running for his life. The Bible says that he hides and escapes from a group of, from an angry mob who had already picked up stones to murder him. Jesus was in the temple teaching. He got these guys angry. They're coming after him. And the Bible says he just went along. So it seems like a normal reading. By a normal reading, Jesus leaves the temple and he's just kind of on his way. Well, I don't know about you. But if if an angry crowd with rocks in their hand are following me, I'm out. I'm as far away from the temple and from the city of Jerusalem as quickly as I possibly can get there. But the Bible says that Jesus just went along as if it were an average day. And as Jesus goes on his way, he notices a blind beggar on the side of the road. Now, it's hard for us who have always enjoyed the gift of sight to really appreciate the challenge or understand the challenge of blindness, particularly if an individual is born blind. I'm amazed by the resilient lives of the few blind people that I know personally and how they have learned to live with that handicap. In fact, when I was a little boy, and this is a story for another day, I actually had a babysitter that was completely blind. She did an amazing job. I'll tell you more about that if you want to another time. But those with a handicap in this first century were pushed to the margin of society, often forced, in many cases, to beg just to survive. It was a difficult and hopeless life. The last possible thing that this blind man expected to be able to do at the end of this day was to see. That brings us to verse 2. His disciples asked Jesus, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? 
this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Okay, park here for just a second. The disciples wanted to know how or why this man was born blind. And somehow they knew that he had been born blind. They wanted to get down to the root of the issue as far as they were concerned. They asked the question, why did this happen? What's the cause of this? And secondly, who is responsible for this? That, those are the questions they wanted to ask, they were asking. And any normal caring human being, when you face or encounter pain, suffering, or injustice, you often ask those same questions. I do too. This past week, I was traveling through Atlanta and noticed a billboard about sex trafficking in the city of Atlanta. And I had those same questions cross my mind. Why is this happening? And who in the world is responsible for this? Because they need to pay. Those are normal questions that we ask. Who, the cause, and the responsibility. And notice that the disciples didn't just ask a question. They actually jumped to a judging conclusion and gave Jesus a multiple choice option for his answer. He said, who sinned? There's the judgment. This man or his parents that he was born blind. Now, what they were doing was reflecting a common religious position of the, the Jewish people in that day that God punished specific sins with specific consequences such as blindness. And so they were really asking, especially in their context, a very, very normal question. But neither of these explanations makes sense. The Bible does teach that all humans are born with a sinful nature. Now, for those of you who may be expecting for the very first time, I don't want to disappoint you or ruin the party, but, but here's the reality. This is how you, you envision your first baby, okay? As beautiful little Jack-Jack in The Incredibles, okay? Big eyes, big blue eyes, hair is so cool and neat, his face is perfect, you know? As my grandmother said, your ears are just right, you know? And, and, and it doesn't take long for you to realize that babies actually are like this. They are what somebody has said, beautiful bundles of depravity. They lie, they deceive to just get what they want, even from day one. Now, okay, all just aside, how can you sin, though, before you're even born? That's what the disciples said. Did this man sin before he was born in order that he was born blind? Or did his parents sin? But that didn't make sense either because even the Jewish law did not hold children accountable for the sins of their parents. But this was the best explanation that the disciples could come up with, with why this man had been blind from birth. Now, here's what I want you to capture. Instead of answering their question and explaining all this away, which Jesus could have done, he redirects their thinking. He redirects their questions from asking about why did this happen and who is responsible to the bigger picture of God's purpose in this situation. Do you notice that? He said, this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, this may provoke another question for you, especially if you are a little bit hesitant about the Christian faith. You may ask, does this mean that God caused this man's blindness for his own purposes? And if you ask that question, and it's a fair question, I believe, it doesn't seem consistent to me. It doesn't seem that that is consistent with God's character to me. Why would God do such a thing? But this is a normal question to ask if you're trying to figure out why did this happen and who is responsible for pain and suffering. God does not cause, let me say this clearly, God does not cause nor is he responsible for human suffering so that he gets the glory when he fixes the problem. That's not what's going on here. Sin and brokenness do play a part. And if you want to blame something, the sin and the brokenness has been passed on to all human beings has a part in the pain and suffering all around us. But Jesus did not go there. He didn't go into this PhD theological treatise to try to explain this to the disciples. He redirects their questions to God's ultimate plan and purposes, even in the middle of pain and suffering. We can spend a lot of time and energy trying to fully understand the cause and responsibility for things that we will never understand in this life. Things like trafficking, things like cancer, things like suicide, pain, suffering, injustice in our lives, in the lives of our family members, in the lives of our neighbors, or even the lives of people on the other side of the world. We read stories every single day. 
And we could drive ourselves crazy trying to answer those questions. Why is this, ha- why is this happening and who is responsible? And we're never going to know the answers fully. I love how the message paraphrases this verse. Verse 3, Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. You are looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. And then listen to what he says in verse 4 and 5. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So catch what Jesus is teaching here. If you don't get anything else, I want you to write down or remember these two principles, these two beams of light that Jesus shines on this situation. Number one, in verse three, Jesus is teaching that God's light is always greater than the darkness. Always. He doesn't explain the darkness. Yes, the darkness exists. Pain, suffering, injustice, those are all real. But God's light is always greater. The second point in verses 4 through 5 that Jesus wanted his disciples and wants us to know is that God shines his light through us in those seasons of darkness. That's what God is doing. He is shining his light through us. And then Jesus demonstrates that point. Verses 6 and 7. Here's the miracle. Having said these things, Jesus spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. You ever stopped and thought about how you would respond to that? I mean, how did this guy respond? I mean, he heard, all he could do was hear what was going on, right? For some of you, that grosses you out. Jesus spit in the dirt and then he began to make mud and he put it on the man's eyes And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, Jesus did not have a standard procedure for his miracles. They were all different. So why in this instance did Jesus choose to do it this way? I think it's because of the people that Jesus was shining his light on in that moment. He was shining his light on this man who was born blind and the light of the world His healing depended on how he responded to the light that he received. It depended on his humility, his obedience, and his willingness just to do what Jesus said. His light also was shining on the religious leaders of that day. And this was a direct and intentional challenge to their man-made authority and rules. In that day, it was against their law for someone to knead dough on the Sabbath day. This was their holy day of the week. And because of that man-made law, they saw mixing of mud as parallel with kneading of dough. And so Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. By doing this miracle the way that he did, he was confronting with his light the religious leaders of that day. Now, if this man were near the temple when Jesus healed him, and that's possible because blind beggars would often gather near the temple where people would come and more people would see them and perhaps give to them. So if this man were at the temple, let me put a map of Jerusalem up here. Uh, it's the, the temple was at kind of the, the eastern side of the city, and so he, he would have had to walk. It's about a half a mile or more to three-quarters of a mile south down to the Pool of Siloam. Now, that's interesting to think about. Um, you may get lost daydreaming about how he actually made it down to the Pool of Siloam. But the Bible just sent, doesn't tell us all those details. It just says... That he went to the pool of Siloam, he obeyed, he did what Jesus said, he washed the mud from his eyes, and he came back seeing. Don't miss that miracle. I believe every word of that is true. It happened exactly like the scripture tells us. Now, this man had never seen a tree. He had felt the sunshine, but he had never seen the sunshine. He didn't know what a house looked like. He didn't know what people looked like, dogs, pets, it doesn't matter. He didn't know, and so there's no doubt as soon as he could see Who do you think he wanted to see first? Jesus. Who is this guy, Jesus, that just did this? We don't even know how old he was. But for years and years, he had been sitting blind and begging. And Jesus gave him his sight just like that. And so through the rest of the chapter, John reveals how these different groups of people, the blind man and the religious leaders, responded to the light of the world. How did this happen? And there's another group we see in verse 8. The neighbors And those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. 
Others said, no, but he's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud. He anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. Now, this sounds like a daytime talk show to me, right? By interviews. Hey, did you see what you see? Did you know this man? What's his name? And, and all the while, the blind man is, is waving his hands and saying, hey, it's me. It's me. I'm the man. I'm the man who sat right here and begged. And I'm the man that went and washed the mud from my eyes. And I am coming back seeing. And notice that the healed man, this is important, called his healer the man called Jesus. At that point in the story, that's all he knew. He knew that how he got his sight back was that this man, whose name was Jesus, put mud on his eyes, he washed, and now he could see. That's all he knew. And that's all that he said. But notice also that people have always asked dumb questions. Here's a dumb question from this group of neighbors. They said, well, where is he? Do you think he knows where Jesus is? He's never seen before. He has no idea what Jesus looks like. He couldn't pick him out of a four-man lineup, much less a crowded city. The blind man has just been able to see, and where is he at? So instead of pursuing Jesus or helping this man pursue Jesus, they instead dragged him to the religious leaders. Look at verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly or formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. So here he goes again. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, talking about Jesus, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how could a man who is a sinner do such things? Notice this, there was a division because, or a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? I love this. He said, he's a prophet. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing the light of the world begin to shine brighter and brighter in the life of this healed man. And we're beginning to see the darkness get darker and darker in those that reject him. The blind man has had some time to process now, and he's thinking about what actually happened to him. And he's realizing that something amazing just happened from this guy called Jesus in my life. And so now he doesn't just say, he's a man called Jesus He calls him a prophet. That's the best thing he could call him at that point. He had heard that word before. He kind of knew that prophets were important people and did some cool things in the Old Testament. So he says, hey, this guy must be a prophet. Now notice how the, the religious leaders respond in disbelief. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe that he had been born blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son? who you say was born blind, how then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. I just got to stop for a second. I had a cousin growing up with cerebral palsy, just a few years younger than me. Um, My mom's sister and her husband had Aaron their firstborn child, born with cerebral palsy. From day one, they had to do, take care of everything for him. He was never verbal. He was never able to walk or carry himself about, do any things that, that a, a normal person would be able to do, born with a very severe handicap. I can only imagine, and, and they were some of the most, by the way, some of the most joyful, God-honoring people I've ever met, impacted my life. But I cannot imagine if if one day Aaron came walking up to his mom and dad, say, hey guys, it's me. This met this guy named Jesus. He's a prophet or something. This is me. I'm here. Can you just imagine? Now, some of you in this room understand this to a whole different level. You have a child with special needs or you have someone in your family has special needs or a disability, and, and this strikes a chord with you. Can you just imagine? But instead of celebrating instead of responding with the normal joy and celebration and gladness that you would expect from parents in this situation, they are oppressed by fear and darkness. 
You see that? And that's the, what the verse says. It says, His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age, ask him. Now, nobody said Jesus is the Christ at this point. Unless I missed it, the blind man said, He's a man called Jesus, and I think he's a prophet said nothing about Jesus being the Christ, you could see the fear also welling up in the religious leaders. And that's the darkness creeping in. These parents were willing to testify to his identity and condition, but they weren't ready to say that Jesus had performed a miracle because that would put him on what? The level with God. Verse 24, so for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, how many times has he told his story now? Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? I love this. Do you also want to become his disciples? Talk about preaching to the choir. This is awesome. This man's becoming a preacher. What's happening? The light shining brighter and brighter. First, he's a man called Jesus. Then I think he's a prophet. Now I think I want to follow him. I want to be his disciple. A simple, honest, personal testimony of this man's encounter with Jesus trumps the tradition, authority, reason, and education of the religious elite. And it still does. Jesus' encounter with our lives and how we experience him personally trumps what any authority has to decree about our relationship with Jesus. The healed man became a bit frustrated, I think, with their unwillingness to accept uncomplicated truth. Verse 28, they, the religious leaders, reviled him. That's a strong word. Saying, you are his disciple, But we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. It's it's getting better. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. You guys should know. You guys should know where a guy like this comes from. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. And that was a true statement. At that point in in human history and even in the scriptures, you will not find an account of somebody being healed that was born blind until this moment. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? And they cast him out. This is a tense scene. The boldness and the brightness of the light of the world shining through this man becomes ever more glorious and ever more bright. And the darkness and the rejection of the established religious leaders becomes equally as obvious. Anybody see game six of the World Series this week? Anybody a Nats or Astros fan? Astros fans kind of went like this, you know, Astros fans. Uh, there you go. I see two of you witnessing back there. Uh, game six, uh, the manager for the Nationals, if you missed it, got in the face of the, the home plate umpire, uh, contesting a call at first base, and he just wouldn't let it drop. You know, I know that's part of the game of baseball to some degree, but it's, you just got to let it go at some point. And he kept arguing, arguing, arguing until if you're familiar with baseball, the umpire cast him out. That's the idea of what happened to this blind man. That he was no longer invited to participate in the community. And it wasn't just, you can't come back to church here anymore. This was a casting out of society as a whole. In other words, you've been a blind beggar all of your life. You're going to stay a beggar all of your life. Light shining brighter, darkness looming deeper. Verse 35, I love how the story ends. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, don't you love that? Jesus found him again. He said, do you believe in the Son of Man? 
This is the title for a son of God, deity. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? And he answered, and who is he, sir, that I may, not, that I may believe in him? He still didn't know. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. What a moment. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus pursues this man a second time, not just to give him physical clarity in his eyes, but to give him spiritual clarity in his heart. Are you willing, he says, to follow Jesus, not just as a man or as a prophet or even as a leader, but as the Lord of your life? And he responds with simple childlike faith, just like he did the first time. Lord, I believe. And now Jesus circles back around to his disciples. You remember those guys that were asking the questions early in the story? He finally comes back to them in verse 39. Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things, and they said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Jesus connects the dots between the physical and the spiritual. The ones who receive the light of God's truth are those who admit their helplessness, hopelessness, and inability to rescue themselves. They respond to an encounter with Jesus with childlike faith, submission, and ultimately worship. Those who say we see are those who believe that they have all the answers already. They don't need any more light. They're in no need of more truth. They're fine just like they are but they're really not. With the time I have left, I want to consider two questions in closing for application in our lives. Number one, have you had an encounter with Jesus personally? Now stay with me here. This is more than proximity. Some of you have had proximity to Jesus for many, many years. You've been in church. You have believing parents. You've heard the story of the gospel, how Jesus died and rose again to pay the price for your sin. You could repeat that same story. You might have proximity, but I'm asking if you have had an encounter with Jesus. An encounter with Jesus is an opportunity for a change of life. And if I understand the Bible uh, correctly, a true encounter with Jesus results in a changed life. Now, this is progressive, just like it was in the story of the blind man. There's an initial belief. There's an initial responding to Jesus, but that continues He continues to change your life as his light shines in your heart. As his truth shines in your heart, he continues to change you again and again. But if Jesus is encountering you for the first time this morning, only you can say that that's true or not. What is happening in your heart? And if Jesus is encountering you with his truth this morning, let me encourage you to step toward the light. You have a choice just like this blind man or these religious leaders. You can either walk to the light and Jesus can continue to shine his light in you or you can reject that light and the darkness will continue to seep in. I read this quote while I was studying. Every person who realizes his or her spiritual blindness becomes a candidate for seeing. Those who refuse to recognize their spiritual blindness place themselves beyond help. Now, if the light that's begun to shine in your heart this morning begins to provoke questions in your heart, that is a wonderful thing. I want to invite you, encourage you, appeal to you to respond to that light. And one way you can do that is by seeing one of our staff members after the service today. We would be more than happy with our limited knowledge, but with our love for Jesus, to try to help answer some questions for you from the Bible. Now, if you're here and you profess faith in Jesus already, let me ask you a question. You're not off the hook. Are you continuing to encounter Jesus on a regular basis? Now, if you're truly born from above, if Jesus truly has shined his light in your heart, you're going to want to do that. But I also understand that there are seasons for every single one of us who name the name of Jesus where it's easy for us to become a little lost. We start kind of wandering off into darkness. We're not spending time with Jesus. We're not in his word. We're not in prayer. We're not in corporate worship like this. We're out of a community group. We're just not around light. So that darkness can kind of creep in. It doesn't mean we're we're not God's children anymore, but it does mean that we need some light in our life. Are you pursuing Jesus as a follower of Jesus? Are you responding on an ongoing basis 
to his truth. And then a second and final practical question for all of us. How do you respond when facing something you didn't expect or didn't understand? At some point, all of us are going to face someone or something, a situation that we just don't get. We don't see the answers. It doesn't make sense to us. It could be a person whose belief system contradicts yours, holds to a different set of values, and challenges your way of thinking. Well, how do you relate to that person? Let me give you an example. In recent days, some of you may or may not be aware of this. This is a guy named Kanye West. Okay, Kanye has just recently come out uh, over the last few weeks with a series of very public professions of faith in Jesus. Okay, He's been on a late-night TV show given profession of faith. He's put out a new album titled Jesus is King. If you know anything about the backstory of Kanye, this is the last thing you would expect from him. But he would say this, and I would, I would say this. Look, I don't know Kanye. I'm reading the same things that you're reading. But what's been surprising is the response of people who call themselves Christians toward this situation. So here's the point. When you're, when you're facing someone like Kanye or somebody in your family, your life, you just don't understand, resist the opportunity to judge or criticize something or someone just because you don't fully understand it. Proverbs 18, 13 says, To answer before listening, that is folly or foolishness and shame. It would definitely help me, and it might help you, to remember two words in every relationship. Listen first. Listen first. Learn to ask questions and walk toward the light instead of immediately shunning it judging it, and jumping to conclusions. Now, it may not be a person that challenges you. It might be a situation or circumstance that came out of the blue and just knocked you on your back. It could be pain, suffering, injustice, and in moments like that, we are so quick, I am, to try to figure it out and jump to a conclusion. And what I really like to do is if I can find somebody to point at and blame for whatever's happening in my life. Sometimes I even blame myself. And you blame yourself just to try to find some answer to this situation. But the bottom line is you and I may never fully understand. I talked with a lady after the first service who has just walked through experiencing the suicide of a 12 or 13 year old girl that she was closely connected with. My family and I have walked through that and some of you in this room have walked through that. You're not going to understand. Just not. So how do, how do we think, how do we relate in moments like that? Let me give you two principles. Let me go back to those two principles that Jesus taught his disciples. Those two beams of light. In moments like that, remember that God's light is always greater than the darkness. The darkness is real. The darkness is painful. The darkness is mysterious. And you're not going to figure it out. But God's grace and God's light is always there. And it's always greater. And finally, don't allow the reality of pain and suffering and brokenness and injustice to harden your heart toward God. Believe that God's light is always greater than the darkness, and instead of doing that, respond by being the light in the darkness. That's what Jesus did, and that's what he wants us to do. Whatever situation or circumstance challenges you and causes you to perhaps feel that darkness and become angry at God, turn that situation into an opportunity to be the light. If the reality that other people are hungry is a darkness to you, then do something about it. Shine a light, fill up a box, and feed a family. If sex trafficking turns your stomach, then shine a light and find out some way that you can help. Whatever it is, whatever challenges you to distrust God's goodness, turn it into an opportunity to use as a light. So in closing... If you have one of these, every time you use it for whatever reason, let that be a reminder to you of these two principles. God's light is always greater than the darkness and that God desires to use you to be the light in the darkness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's been good to be in your word this morning. Thank you so much for this story, this amazing story of this blind man. Lord Jesus, you pursued him. You came after him, you found him, not once but twice. And you didn't just give him physical healing, you healed his heart spiritually. You opened his eyes to see who you are. 
And Lord, I don't know, but there may be somebody in the room this morning that is encountering Jesus for the first time. They've heard these songs that we've sung. They've watched people pray. We've opened this book called the Bible, and we've talked a lot about Jesus. Lord, if, if that person this morning is, is seeing the light, it's beginning to shine in their heart, I pray that they would walk to it. Lord, may they respond to the light in simple faith and belief and worship. God, rescue their hearts today. Lord, for those of us who know you, I pray that we would continue to pursue the light. God, there's believers in the room this morning who are struggling because of the reality, the hard realities of life. Would you encourage them with your light, with your truth, with your purpose that maybe we don't ever understand? And then, God, I pray that you would give us grace to respond to people and situations, not with blame or criticism or judgment, but with questions and a willingness to receive the light that you can give us. And God, help us to be the light. Help us to get involved. Help us to take a step. Help us to do something to be a reflection of your light in this dark world. God, give us the grace for these things, and we love you in Jesus' name.